In the year 1985, one film revved up the engines of our imagination and sent us through time. Now buckle up and relive the thrill of Back to the Future, but this time, it's all in words. This is a novelization of Back to the Future, specifically the time travel scene. The clock jumped from 1227 to 1228, the strumming of guitar strings on the radio filling the room with a melody, accompanied by the soulful voice of a singing man. Marty had fallen asleep with the radio playing, his body twisted on his messy bed. Now he was both on his belly and then on his side, his face pressed into the pillow. His mouth hung open and a tiny puddle of drool had collected around the cotton of the pillow. The phone rang, cutting through the music. Before the echo of the first ring had even died away, Marty began to stir. He woke with a half yawn, his arm reaching for the cordless phone on the bedside table, even as he propped himself up, eyes still closed. Hello, he said, his voice thick with sleep. Marty, you didn't fall asleep, did you? A rough voice on the other end of the phone demanded. Now fully sitting up, Marty blinked and looked at his watch, then at the room's clock. Ah. Uh, no, don't be silly, he replied, trying to sound awake. Listen, this is very important. I forgot my video camera. Can you stop by my place and pick it up on your way to the mall? The voice insisted. Marty reached for a half-eaten Snickers bar on his bedside table and took a bite. Yeah, on my way, he mumbled and hung up the phone, ending the conversation. With the JVC camera firmly in hand, Marty rode his skateboard down the slope, the rubber plastic wheels screeching against the black asphalt. The glowing signage of the mall loomed ahead, announcing to the world, or at least to this small town, that they had arrived at the greatest place on earth. The vibrant letters spelled out. The Pines Mall, and right below, the time glowed. 1.15 a.m. Marty skidded to a halt next to the sign. Before him sprawled the parking lot where he spotted a lone vehicle, a truck. Once, with a big plastic strawberry ice cream cone on its roof, it might have been an ice cream truck. But that was a fairy tale, and this was the Pines Mall. This truck was a plain, ordinary white truck, dark mud, contrasting starkly around its wheels. On its side, the name Dr. E. Brown Enterprises was displayed in simple black letters underlined by 24-hour scientific services. A shaggy sheepdog sat nearby, watching the truck with patient eyes, as if waiting for something or someone. Marty picked up his skateboard and approached, but not to the truck first. That would be uncharacteristic of him. Instead, he went to the dog. He crouched down and reached behind the dog's ear, stroking it. The dog responded with sounds of affection, Marty noticed a digital clock on its collar. Einstein? Hey, Einstein, where's the dock, boy? A low hum of an engine filled the air, so strong that Marty felt his chest vibrate. Both he and Einstein turned to the truck. Smoke billowed from its back. It opened slowly. Holding the JVC camcorder, Marty stood, eyes fixed on what was being revealed. Einstein beside him tilted his head sideways. As the door opened fully, Two glowing red lights cut through the darkness. Then, they moved backwards, wheels rolling down to reveal a modified car, a familiar car, a sports car, a DeLorean. It sported boxy thrusters and a complex network of mechanical objects, wires, tubes, a machine's nervous system made of steam and pure madness. The car plate read, Outer Time. The car glided out of the truck, headlights blazing. The driver's door opened, not sideways but overhead. More smoke poured out, and from this haze emerged a man. His white hair stood as wild as his modified DeLorean. Clad in white overalls, digital clocks hanging around his neck, he clutched a clipboard. A pen clenched between his lips. His eyes, wide and shadowed, darted left and right. Beneath his overalls peeked a collar adorned with floral prints. Doc! Marty yelled. 
Doc turned to face Marty, and the wildness in his eyes vanished, replaced by genuine joy. He smiled, taking the pen from his mouth. Marty, you made it, he exclaimed, his hand gesturing grandly toward the car. Welcome to my latest experiment. This is the big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. Uh, wow, it's a DeLorean. Marty moved closer, his eyes wide. Woo, how? Doc's hand shot out, grabbing Marty's sleeve and pulling him back. His eyes narrowed, as if to say, no time for this. Stay with me, Marty. All your questions will be answered. Roll tape and we'll proceed. Marty obliged, stepping back but still hungry for answers. In a brief, impulsive moment, he pointed at Doc. Is that a Devo suit? Doc raised a hand. Never mind that now. Marty retreated, turning on the camcorder, pointing it at Doc and the new experiment. All right, I'm ready, he said. Good evening. I'm Dr. Emmett Brown. I'm standing here on the parking lot at Twin Pines Mall. It's Saturday morning, October 26th, 1985. He glanced at his wristwatch. 1.18 a.m., and this is temporal experiment number one. Doc darted toward Einstein. Come on, Amy. Hey, boy, get in there. The dog stood, wagging its tail, and Doc guided him into the car. Here now. Marty, still recording, drew closer. Get your seatbelt on, Doc instructed, fastening it around the dog and giving it a final tug. He petted Einstein's furry back affectionately. Marty adjusted his position, focusing the camcorder on Doc and Einstein. Doc grabbed the digital clocks around his neck and on Einstein's collar, displaying them to the camera. Please note, he said, that Einstein's clock here is in precise synchronization with my control watch. The clocks read 1.19 a.m. Got it? Doc asked. Right, check, Doc. Good, Doc said, patting Einstein's head. Have a good trip, Einstein. He grabbed a large remote control inside the car and warned, Watch your head, as he closed the door, locking the dog inside. He stood beside Marty, the remote's antenna fully extended. On its upper left side was a digital readout, labelled miles per hour, reading zero, zero. You got that thing hooked up to the car? Marty inquired. The DeLorean's engine roared to life. Watch this, Doc said, manipulating a joystick on the control. The whole ton of the car lurched backward, wheels screeching, turning and swaying as Doc's unblinking eyes followed the vehicle. The DeLorean drove away and Marty shifted the camcorder towards Doc. Not me! The car! The car! Doc commanded. Marty refocused on the DeLorean, capturing its zigzagging movement until it reversed into its final position. Doc was already in motion, and before Marty knew it, a hand was clutching his orange jacket, yanking him metres away to a spot right in front of the car. They stopped, and Marty aimed the camcorder once more. If my calculations are correct, Doc said, his hands dancing over the controller. When this car hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious shit. He flicked a lever labelled brakes. A red light glowed. He nudged a joystick and the car's wheels spun wildly, yet it remained stationary. White smoke spiralled from the friction between the rubber and the asphalt. The digital readout climbed 22 miles per hour. 41.7 miles per hour. 52.6 miles per hour. Doc shot Marty a crazed glance, appraising his attire. A mad smile twisted his face before he refocused on the DeLorean. 64.1 miles per hour. 65.3 miles per hour. With another flick, Doc released the brakes and the car lunged forward, speeding directly at them. Marty started to dodge, but Doc's grip on his sleeve yanked him back. Watch this! 77.8 miles per hour. 78.9 miles per hour. 83.3 miles per hour. 87.2 miles per hour. 88.1 miles per hour. The front of the car erupted in sparks, a bluish light haloing the bumper. The sound of cracking electricity enveloped the machine, a metallic comet streaking towards them. This is it. I'm going to die. Marty's mind screamed. Three feet away, the car vanished in a white explosion, leaving behind parallel lines of flame. What did I tell you? Doc hollered, jumping in excitement. 
88 miles per hour. Marty, numb with shock, wandered to the burning tracks. A license plate, out of time, spun on the asphalt before falling with a metallic clatter. Doc ceased his celebration, consulting his wristwatch. The temporal displacement occurred at exactly 1.20 a.m. and zero seconds. Marty picked up the plate, feeling its scorching heat, then dropped it. Jesus Christ, Doc, you disintegrated Einstein. Calm down, Marty. I didn't disintegrate anything. Doc approached, pen and notepad in hand. The molecular structure of both Einstein and the car are completely intact. He scribbled something. Then where the hell are they? The appropriate question is, when? When the hell are they? You see, Einstein has just become the world's first time traveler. I sent him one minute into the future, to be exact. And at precisely 1.21 a.m. and zero seconds, we shall catch up to him and the time machine. Marty's heart pounded, understanding dawning. Wait a minute, Doc. Are you telling me you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Besides, the stainless steel construction made the flux dispersal. His digital watch beeped. Look out! They leapt aside as the DeLorean materialised where it had disappeared, screeching to a halt. Staring at the ice-covered time machine, Doc and Marty approached cautiously. A violent hiss and billowing white fumes erupted from the exhaust. They hesitated, then Doc advanced, peering through the frosty windows for a glimpse of Einstein inside. He touched the driver's door handle and immediately jumped back, yelling in surprise. What, is it hot? Marty asked, his face set in an unmoving scowl. The camera in his hand angled away from the scene. Cold, damn cold, Doc replied. He used the tip of his shoe to lift the handle, and with it, the entire door. The layer of ice cracked, and inside the car, Einstein was revealed, his tongue hanging out as he excitedly jumped at the sight of his owner. Doc rushed to his dog, scratching the side of his face. Einstein, you little devil! He took off his digital watch and the one around Einstein's collar and compared the two. Einstein's read 0120, while Doc's was 01. 21. Einstein's clock is exactly one minute behind mine, and still ticking, Doc said, unlocking the seatbelt to free Einstein, who immediately darted inside the truck. Marty's mouth fell open. He's all right. He's fine. And he's completely unaware that anything happened. As far as he's concerned, the trip was instantaneous. That's why his watch is a minute behind mine. He skipped over that minute to instantly arrive at this moment in time. Come here he said, tugging on Marty's jacket. I'll show you how it works. They moved towards the car, Marty pointing the camcorder once more. Doc sat in the driver's seat and began his explanation. First, you turn the time circuits on. His hand found a lever connected to a contraption near the clutch and turned it. An electronic sound filled the air and a panel on the dashboard flashed to life. It displayed three levels. Destination time, present time and last time departed. Doc pointed at the destination time. This here tells you where you're going. He then pointed to present time. Tells you where you are. Then the last time departed. This one tells you where you were. You input your destination time on this keypad. Say you want to see the signing of the Declaration of Independence. He entered the date 07041776 and it appeared on destination time, or witness the birth of Christ. He punched in 12250000, which also appeared. Here's a red letter date in the history of science, he continued, keying in November 5th, 1955. Yes, of course, November 5th, 1955. Okay, what happened? Doc laughed. That was the day I invented time travel. His face softened into a reminiscing smile. I remember it vividly. I was standing on the edge of my toilet, hanging a clock. The porcelain was wet. I slipped and hit my head on the sink when I came to... I had a revelation. A vision. A picture in my head. A picture of this. He turned to the back of the car, pointing at a centrepiece. It looked like the letter Y, 
and seem to be made of neon lights. This is what makes time travel possible. The flux capacitor. Flux capacitor. It's taken me almost 30 years and my entire family fortune to realize the vision of that day. My God, has it been that long? Doc exclaimed, standing up. Things have certainly changed around here. I remember when this was all farmland as far as the eye can see. Old man Peabody owned all of this. He had this crazy idea about breeding pine trees. He walked towards the truck while Marty kept recording. This is, uh, heavy duty, Doc. This is great. Does it run on regular unleaded gasoline? Doc stopped and turned. Unfortunately, no. It requires something with a little more kick. Plutonium. Uh, plutonium? Wait a minute, Marty stammered, dropping the recorder. Are you telling me this sucker is nuclear? Hey, 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 keep rolling there, Doc demanded. No, this sucker's electrical, but I need a nuclear reaction to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity I need. Doc, you don't just walk into a store and buy plutonium. Did you rip that off? Marty asked, still pointing the camera at Doc. Of course, from a group of Libyan nationalists. They wanted me to build them a bomb, so I took their plutonium and gave them a bomb casing full of used pinball machine parts. Doc replied, smiling. Come on, let's get you a radiation suit. Jesus, said Marty. We must prepare to reload. Suited up head to toe in a hazmat suit, Doc's gloved hands opened a two-by-one-foot yellow case, its surface a mosaic of biohazard stickers screaming a silent warning, stay away or die. Marty, peering through his own hazmat helmet, could only watch in astonishment as Doc revealed 12 glass cylinders filled with a liquid clear as water. Suspended within each, a smaller cylinder contained a mysterious red substance. With precision, Doc selected one of the cylinders, then closed the box with an ominous click. Marty, equally clad in yellow hazmat gear, trailed behind, the camcorder's lens capturing every deliberate move. Reaching the car, Doc's hands maneuvered to the back, where the cylinder found its destiny. At the very core of the time machine's second half, he uncovered a round latch, twisted it open, and pulled out the lid. The cylinder went in with a delicacy that spoke of its precious contents. As he twisted it counterclockwise, the smaller cylinder was drawn into the machine, leaving Marty to jump in surprise. With practiced ease, Doc withdrew the larger cylinder, setting it aside. He replaced the lid, then removed his helmet, his face a portrait of satisfaction. It's all safe now. Everything's lead-lined. He picked up the larger cylinder, moving it away as Marty removed his helmet. Doc's final journey to the yellow case was accompanied by a stern warning. Don't you lose those tapes now, he said, his voice edged with excitement. I need that as a record. The cylinder slid back into its place. Let's put this back here. His foot snapped the case shut. Grinning ear to ear, Doc started toward the car, but stopped midway, his face a picture of sudden realization. Whoop, he exclaimed. Almost forgot my luggage. The leather case beside the plutonium container was swiftly retrieved and he resumed his path to the car. Who knows if they've got cotton underwear in the future? I'm allergic to all synthetics. The future? Marty's voice trembled, the camera dropping once more. That's where you're going. That's right, Doc declared, his eyes ablaze with a dreamer's fire. Twenty-five years into the future. I've always dreamed of seeing the future, looking beyond my years, seeing the progress of mankind. He paused a playful glint in his eye. Why not? I'll also be able to see who wins the next 25 World Series. Uh, Doc? Huh? Look me up when you get there. Doc's eyes softened, and he gave Marty a reassuring look. Indeed, I will. He nodded with a warm smile. Roll em. Camcorder in hand, Marty aimed it at Doc, recording for posterity. Doc grasped the car door handle and pulled it upward, the door swinging open with a graceful arc. Doc cleared his throat, his voice rich with anticipation. 
I, Dr. Emmett Brown, am about to embark on a historic journey. He glanced inside the car, his face lighting up with a smile, then suddenly contorted into an expression of exasperation. What am I thinking of? I almost forgot to bring extra plutonium. How do I expect to get back? One pellet, one trip, I must be out of my mind. From a distance, a sharp bark pierced the night. Einstein, Doc's faithful dog, peered at them through beady eyes. Both Doc and Marty Turnard, drowned by the sound. What is it, Einie? Doc called, concern in his voice. Einstein's gaze is shifted, fixed on something beyond the parking lot, waiting. Bright headlights pierced the darkness, announcing the approach of a van. Doc's face twisted into a scowl, his joy extinguished like a candle's flame. He began striding towards the mysterious van, his once cheerful demeanour replaced by a cold dread. Oh my God, they found me. I don't know how, but they found me. His voice, once full of excitement, now filled with terror. He yelled at the top of his lungs, Run for it, Marty! Still pointing the camcorder at Doc, Marty's voice trembled. Who? Who? Doc sprinted to his truck, desperation in his eyes. Who do you think? The Libyans. He pointed frantically at the van. When Marty followed Doc's finger, his heart dropped into his stomach. The van was now charging toward them, a man on the rooftop, rifle in hand. Panic and fear flooded Marty's face as he dropped the camcorder, realization sinking in. Holy shit! Marty ducked down, terror taking hold. The air exploded with the sound of bullets. Doc hit the ground, sparks blasting where his head had been moments before, the bullets ricocheting off his truck. Doc scrambled up. I'll draw their fire! He lunged for a case next to the plutonium, pulling out a silver revolver. His eyes, once wild with fear, now narrowed with determination. He aimed at the man on the van's rooftop, his hands steady, his focus unwavering. He pulled the trigger. Nothing. Again. Still nothing. His determination shattered, replaced by disbelief. He smacked the gun, the metal rattling. He peered down the barrel, his face a mask of utter shock. Bullets whizzed through the air, aimed at the doctor. Doc Brown ducked and darted away as the van bore down on him, the distance closing with each second. Doc, wait! Marty's voice crackled with panic, his body shielded behind the DeLorean. The van screeched to a halt, mere feet from Dr. Emmett Brown. The terrorist, eyes narrowed and rifle trained, aimed directly at Doc. With his arms raised, revolver still in hand, Doc's eyes locked with the man on the rooftop. He tossed the revolver towards the van, his face a grim mask of resignation. The terrorist's finger tightened on the trigger, unleashing a hailstorm of laid. Doc's body jerked with each hit, his life's light extinguished in an instant. Eyes wide and heart pounding, Marty screamed, No! He charged towards the fallen doctor, anger and grief mingling in his cry. You bastards! The terrorist swiveled the rifle, aiming at Marty. Panic surged through him as he darted behind the truck, bullets ripping through the air where he'd been. The screech of tires filled the air, followed by the rev of the van's engine. Marty's legs moved of their own accord, a desperate flight from death. He stopped, terror freezing him in place as the rifle's muzzle found him once more. His body went rigid, his eyes closed, bracing for the pain, the end. The terrorist squeezed the trigger, a faint click, silence. Marty's eyes snapped open, relief flooding him, as he saw the terrorist shaking his useless rifle. Without thinking, he lunged for the DeLorean. Go! The terrorist barked, but the van remained stubbornly still. Marty's hand found the door handle, but his gaze was drawn to Doc's lifeless form. The van roared to life behind him, forcing his attention back to escape. He slammed the door and keyed the engine. The DeLorean sprang forward, narrowly avoiding the van as it barreled towards him. With a sharp turn of the wheel, Marty swerved left, the van hot on his tail, bullets chasing him. He fumbled with the clutch, his arm inadvertently striking the lever for the flux capacitor's activation. More bullets, more turns. Death pursued him relentlessly. He swerved the car in a snake-like pattern, the shouts of the gunman echoing in his ears. Come on, move, damn it, he urged the car, desperation etched in his voice. 
66 miles per hour, 75 miles per hour, 83 miles per hour. Sparks flew as bullets peppered the road, the relentless pursuit continuing. He jerked the wheel right, his speed plummeting to 35 miles an hour. A complete U-turn, momentarily halting the rain of bullets. Marty's eyes darted to the side mirror, and what he saw made his heart stop. A terrorist wielding a bazooka, the tip glinting with a small attached rocket. His eyes went wide, the blood in his veins turning to ice. Holy shit, he stared at the speedometer, determination setting in. Let's see if you bastards can do 90. With a forceful pull on the clutch and a relentless push on the pedal, he commanded the Delorean to race forward. The engine howled, surging ahead with an animalistic frenzy, leaving the van and its murderous occupants in the dust. Marty's eyes flicked to the speedometer again. 77 miles per hour. A frown creased his brow, a nagging feeling clawing at the edges of his mind. 87 miles per hour. 88 miles per hour. A bright flash erupted from behind, followed by a blinding cascade of light that enveloped the entire car in a split second. Suddenly, Marty found himself careening through a field of grass. The world transformed to a lampless night. A shadowy figure loomed ahead, too close to avoid. The car struck it with a sickening thud, and the face of a scarecrow splattered across his windshield. Marty's scream tore through the night. He wrenched the wheel to the left, sending the scarecrow tumbling away. His eyes followed its descent, but when he looked forward again, the open doors of a barn filled his vision. A final yell escaped him, his voice rising in a crescendo of terror as he crashed into stacks of hay. The world exploded into chaos, pin-like yellow straws dancing in a wild storm under the cold glow of a blue moon. <laughs>